when the pawn hits the conflicts, he thinks like a king. What do you know? Throws the blows when he goes to the fight. And he'll win the whole thing when he enters the ring. There's no body to batter when your mind is your might. So when you go solo, hold your own hand. And remember that death is the greatest of heights. And if you know where you stand, then you know where to land. And when you fall, it won't matter, because you'll know that you're right. But sometimes you'll be wrong. But, um, it's okay. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Hi, I am so sorry I took so long to make this video. I really struggled making this episode until I realized that I kinda needed to rest for a little bit. Now I'm back for good this time. I'm gonna recap what happened last episode, and then we'll start. We can't waste any more time, since we have to meet with the Countess immediately. We're very late. Okay. We got a message from God saying that Azra was gonna kill us, so we sent Millie Bobby Brown after him. Then, I met someone. <laughs> After that, we tried to get to the palace, but along the way, we ran into a couple of gingers, I mean people. One of them actually led us to the palace, so now, we're finally here. Hopefully, this episode isn't as painfully slow as the last one, and we actually get to do something. So, let's start. Inside the palace, the floors, walls, and steep ceilings are all clean-cut, polished stone. A servant with a blue feathered cap comes sweeping up to us. With a deep bow, they pass me and dash to Portia's side. Chamberlain, how are we doing on time? Impeccable timing. The first course will be served shortly. Her ladyship has yet to descend. What the hell is that? Why the hell is that? What the hell is going on? Portia heaves a sigh of relief and hands her fruit basket off to the bright-eyed servant. Perfect! Tell the kitchen that our guest has arrived! With a curtsy, the servant slips away, disappearing behind a panel in the wall, which slides seamlessly shut. I'll show you to the dining room. Her ladyship will be there soon. Dining? With the countess? What? what Don't tell me you thought we wouldn't feed you! She leads me to a fine mahogany door at the end of the cavernous hall. <laughs> It's mahogany! And she opens the door, leading me inside. I step into the dining room. Rich scents fill my lungs, unfamiliar and tantalizing. Before me is a long table laid heavy with platters of the most careful delicacy. Portia pulls out a chair for me, and I sink into the plush seat. Now that the food is right in front of me, my hunger returns tenfold, but the Countess has yet to arrive. Okay, pull it out. I look around the room, and notice the strange painting on the wall across from me. We'll return after these messages. Today's lesson is on how to become fancy. There are four essential rules to this. The first is to look fancy. Adorn yourself with flowing robes, suits, or dresses of any kind of color, preferably purple or red. You can never go wrong with a powdered wig. Put on nothing but the finest makeup and golden jewelry. The second rule is to talk fancy. Surprisingly, you do not have to speak in the British or French tongue. All you have to do is sound sophisticated. Use extravagant words such as diminutive, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, and pithy. Always be eccentric yet polite with your words. The third rule is to laugh fancy. Laugh at anything that is not funny within the slightest, but stay completely silent when something is. There is also a certain way to laugh. I can only describe it as pure evil. It sounds like this. <laughs> the fourth and very last rule is to appreciate the arts. Paintings, statues, and literature make great discussions with your fancy peers. Music is another good one. However, any song that is made after 1950 is considered to be music of the devil. So no Da Baby, no Doja Cat, no Kanye, no Weezer, and definitely no My Chemical Romance. 
fancy people enjoy jazz, but they absolutely adore classical. Mozart, Beethoven or Bach will create a lively atmosphere in their mansion home. And there you have it. Now you know how to act fancy. The following program is brought to you in living color on NBC. The scene is that of a meal shared among a host of figures with the heads of beasts. The table is laden with small animals provided by a central character with the head of a goat. Rays of gold glitter around its head and its red eyes are strikingly lifelike. Wait a damn minute. <laughs> Wait a damn. This painting right here is so important. This painting right here is the key to solving this entire game. That is how essential this painting is. And you might be wondering why it seems just like a stupid little painting. Duh, 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 duh. Wait, wait till you hear what I have to say. This painting exposes what the council really is. We need to look at the symbolism behind this painting. So let's start off with the goat. This goat certainly doesn't act like a goat. It's doing human things. It's sitting down like a human. Its proportions are completely off. They're eating food goats aren't supposed to eat, and they're sharing it with other animals. No doubt about it. This goat is a demon. This goat is a demon. This goat right here resembles one of the most infamous demons of all time, Baphomet, or a demon similar to him. Look at the halo. Now, look at the ray of light surrounding it. If you know medieval paintings, you would know that when a ray of light is surrounding a person's head, that usually means that that person is holy. There's a ray of light surrounding this goat. And it doesn't look like, it certainly doesn't look like a traditional halo. It's more of the sun. It looks more like the sun itself. You see those tiny little golden lines surrounding him? Those are meant to be the sun's rays. It literally says it in the description. This goat views itself as a holy being. This goat is a god. He is meant to be worshipped. He is meant to be revered. He is meant to be feared. And look at the animals. They're having a feast, just like us. It's obvious that the animals represent the council. They're all worshiping this one god right here. It's a cult. Everyone in this game is part of a cult. Do you see the goblet? That's not juice. That's not wine. That is blood. Oh my God. That's human sacrificial blood. <laughs> now, I have a theory. I have a theory. There is something about us in this game. There's something about us that makes us so special. Azra says it, Nadia says it, we have a gift for something. Because we're so special, we have to be sacrificed to this thing. But they knew they weren't going to get us so easily. So, Nadia lured us to her palace. Nadia lured us to her palace. They're gonna lure us. They're gonna give us gifts. Oh my god! And guess what that weird man said? We are blindly to the slaughter and they will offer us a gift! They're going to sacrifice us. Every single one of them is evil. And our goal is to manipulate them with romance so we will not die. We have to get the good ending. Now, smaller detail. Look at the eyes. Notice the specific details that Orpheus uses to describe the eyes. He describes them as strikingly lifelike. Of course, it's strikingly lifelike. 
Someone's watching us behind this painting. Have you ever watched those Scooby-Doo episodes where they're walking around a creepy mansion and the paintings are like watching them? That's what's happening right now. Someone is watching us right here. They're probably the main leader. They're probably the guy that's behind all of this. We gotta be very careful. I'm so powerful. My mind, oh, it amazes me sometimes. Welcome, Orpheus. I see you are admiring the painting. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yes, ma'am. <laughs> we are appreciating the arts. My head whips toward the head of the table. <laughs> Countess Nadia is taking her seat. Her lips curve into a placid smile when her eyes meet mine. Do you like it, Orpheus? The painting. No. 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 Yes, it is exquisitely marvelous in its grandeur splendor. Boy, if you don't- Yes. She drums her elegant fingers along her cheekbone, watching me with idle interest. Oh, you have peculiar taste. Yes, I do. I have peculiar taste for all the arts, including the art of food. Can we eat now, please? I cannot say I care much for it. Then why do you have the pin up in your room? So why does it remain on the wall, you may ask? A servant appears in my side to place a bowl of yogurt and cucumber soup before me. YOGURT! YOGURT! I carefully bring it to my mouth and drink. Sentimental value, I suppose. It was one of my husband's favorites. The Countess' husband, Count Lucio. That's probably the guy watching us behind the painting right there. As his name takes form in my mind, the goat figure before me becomes somehow familiar. Suddenly, its red eyes are so vivid that I can almost feel them See? He's watching us! It literally says he's watching us! Beautiful red. Oh, hell no. Nah. He probably has hypnotism powers. Girl, look away! Ah, oh, yes, it is a beautiful red. Then we fall asleep and we wake up at the altar where they stab us to death with a stake. I didn't realize that I'd said the words aloud. See? Hypnotism! What the hell is that? Amusement shimmers in the Countess's brilliant eyes. Shut up. The goat headed one in the middle is Count Lucio. Or so it is supposed to be. Supposed to be? It's someone else. Or maybe Count Lucio is secretly that thing. Maybe the demon is possessing him. Providing for the people as he saw himself. He certainly knew how to entertain. My empty bowl is whisked away. In its place is a dish of flaky golden savories. I don't even think we should eat. Because they're probably gonna, like, poison us. I know how fondly the people of the city remember the Count's masquerade. Oh yes, I remember the masquerade. It was so vividly exquisite and marvelous. Did you ever attend the masquerade, Orpheus? Yes, I attended 3,470 times. It was that supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Our annual revelry in honor of my husband's birthday, a delight to all Vesuvia. It is a memory now tinged with bitterness. After Count Lucio was murdered at the last masquerade. Watch, Lucio's probably not dead. He's probably not even dead. He's alive, just watching us behind the painting. I nearly choke. <laughs> Mercifully, I catch myself. My pulse quickens nonetheless. Such a terrible shock to the guests. Such a vicious injustice upon this house. Yes, this was so unfair. It was so wrong. It was so, um, it was so unwrongfully horrid. Oh, if you don't! I am 
throwing up all your exquisite, delicious food at the thought of his dead, lumpy body. To slaughter the host while he celebrates, sharing his joy and prosperity with open doors. They're probably lying about that. I try to focus on my food, but my eyes keep drifting back to the painting. See, it's hypnotism! Count Lucio's murder. The story is full of holes, muddied by wild rumors and unanswered questions. Each one of these weird animal things resembles a character of the Arcana. Look at this. This cheetah is wearing Nadia's clothes. That obviously represents Nadia. The wolf creature is probably the weird hooded man. The dove is probably either Portia or Azra. Because that looks like something Portia would wear, but also Azra. Dove represents peace. And Azra is a hippie, so that could be him. Julian. Julian's the horse because it looks just like the death card that we pulled on him. And there are three more on the other side. There are three more on the other side. That's probably his counsel. Oh, my mind. Oh. But the end is always the same. The Count retired to his chambers. And by midnight, he and his chamber were engulfed in flames. Get new. The culprit was captured on the spot. But before he could be brought to justice, he escaped. Ever since that day, guests to the palace have been few indeed. I look away from the portrait just in time to meet the Countess's keen gaze. But now that you are here... Now that I'm here, she says it with such gravity, such confidence. Countess, what does any of this have to do with me? Orpheus, you're going to be sacrificed to the devil. Orpheus, you're going to be sacrificed to the devil. The masquerade is precisely why I called you here. This year, I intend to hold the masquerade once more. Watch, there's probably not even a masquerade. There's probably not even a masquerade here. It's just one big cult party, and then, like, they're gonna try to get us to go, and then we die. I stare at her. So does every servant in the room. How? Why? What the hell is that? Why the hell is that? What the hell's going on? <laughs> See, they wrote it as if the servants didn't even know that she was gonna bring the masquerade back because it doesn't exist. Because if it existed, they would have known. The festivities in Lucio's honor will be more fantastical than ever. There is but one loose end in need of time. Count Lucio's murderer still roams free to this day. Dr. Julian Dvorak, my husband's former physician. I sit very still, suddenly cold all over. Dr. Julian Dvorak. Now I remember the name on the wanted posters. Now I know exactly who broke into my shop. Dr. Dvorak confessed to the crime when we caught him. All that is left is his sentence. Execution by hanging. There's a terrible crash. Please call her to book alone. Porteous face is stricken with horror. At her feet, the broken remnants of our dessert are seeping into the floor. You wretched skank! First, you are a ginger. You are a red-headed ginger. Then, you bump into me and touch my arm. You gave me gingivitis. In fact, the reason why I was such on a long hiatus was because I was recovering from your disease. And then, this beautiful, exquisite, marvelous dessert. Its body is slumped, melting towards this carpet floor. Unacceptable! 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 I can't watch this anymore. Excuse me. Portia, f forgive me, milady. Slippery hands. You are- You're going to be sacrificed to the devil. Two servants rush to her aid, sweeping away the shattered mess with wind sprint speed. This is where you come in, Orpheus. <laughs> Dr. Dvorak has been very elusive, but you have quite the reputation. Rumor has it that you have surpassed even your master, Azra. Who's spreading these rumors, though? I myself see the future in dreams, whether I like it or not. <laughs> and this is how I know that you are the one who will find Dr. Dvorak. Bruh. If I say no, they're probably going to kill me. This is a dumb question, because she already said what will happen if we find him, but... 
And if we find him? The countess sets down her glass. When we find him, we will bring him before the people so that all may see his long-awaited punishment. Let's give it everything we've got! It's punishment time! And so, to commence the festivities, the doctor will die on the gallows for his terrible crime. Ooh, how supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Ah, 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 The Countess rises. On instinct, I rise as well. Portia? Portia! Yes, milady. Show Orpheus to the guest quarters. I imagine there is much to ponder before the night is out. Right away, milady. Portia pulls me to my feet, and with a humble bow, whisks me to the doorway. Portia is quiet as she ushers me down the hall toward my room. After a few turns, we pass a wide staircase, veiled in shadow. A draft rushes down from the floor above, prickling my skin. It's cold, and it smells of ash. <laughs> Curled up on the bottom step are two large, lanky dogs. Fathomless eyes fix upon me, and they rise slowly, without a sound. They're probably Lucio's pets. They look as though they could strike at any moment. I sense no ill intent. I hold out my hand, and they approach to sniff it. Their huffing breaths tickle my skin, and their tails start slowly wagging. Well, this is bizarre. They never take kindly to strangers. It's just how they were trained, but I've never seen them act like this. Slim snouts brush up against my sides as the dogs investigate me further. Satisfied, they draw back, looking at me expectantly. Go away. There's something unsettling in their gaze. It reminds me of something. It's not natural for dogs to have red eyes, I don't think. This is probably like a disease going on. I take a careful step back, giving them plenty of space. The hounds trot dutifully back to their spot. They nearly blend into the marble, but their eyes remain fixed on me. Oh, no wonder they're like this. They haven't had their ca chamomile cakes. What is a chamomile cake? C chamomile. An aromatic European plant of the daisy family with white and yellow flowers. Of course you're like this. You've been feeding them flowers. You're not even feeding them dog food. You're not even... You're not even feeding them meat, you're feeding them flowers. Flower cakes. She looks nervously from me to the two dogs, still as statues. They're, wa watch, she's gonna leave, watch, she's gonna leave, and then they're gonna, like, kill us. What, Herophius, and it's probably best to keep your distance from them. Social distancing always works. I'll be right back with those cakes. Portia swoops through a sliding panel on the wall. I'm left alone in the hallway with the dogs. I feel the bigger one sniff my side insistently. When I look down, it simply pulls back and stares. Then the smaller one is sniffing my other side, huffing samples of my scent. I whirl around, and it sits back on its haunches, watching me innocently, cheeky. As I look into its one sanguine eye, an unsettling sensation ripples through my body like a wave of fever. Oh, now we gotta go? I step back gaze darting up and down the corridor. The voice was coming from the top of the stairs? I can only see so far into the hollow gloom. See, that's Lucio! But there's no one there. I nearly jump when I feel yanking at my garments. Go, let me go! <laughs> the dogs, their teeth are buried in my clothes, unrelenting as they drag me onto the stairs. I trip up the first few steps and their tails start wagging. Hey! I try to wrench myself. Shut up! It's my day. It's time for euthanization. The dogs only let me go at the top of the stairs. The floor and walls are frigid stone, and the air smells of ash. My head is spinning, and I hardly feel the chill in the air. Though my heart is hammering, I summon a weak glimmer of light in my palm. I look around for the dogs, but they're nowhere to be seen. There is a door ahead, partly open. Inside is a deeper darkness, swallowing the feeble rays of light. Rays of light! Lucille's the goat! Shut up! Now, before we venture into undiscovered territory, I have to say a couple things about what's happening right now. You see this white bubble right here? Yeah, that's a paid choice. You use these coins up here to access extra scenes in the game. So, for example, if you want to know more about the story, you might have to pay. Or if you want to hang out with someone, that could be a paid choice too. Now, I just want to say, before anything else, that the paid choices do not impact the ending in any way, shape, or form. It's just there to add something more to the game. 
However, Nix Hydra, the company who made this game, does not allow people to make YouTube videos showing these choices. So I, I can't go down this hall. It's very upsetting, but I can perfectly understand why. I don't even want to go down this hall anyway. I, I, we're leaving. Hell no, to the no, no, no. Breaking into a run, I dash back the way I came. The portraits on the walls. Watch me run with cold aristocratic stares. See, it literally says the portraits are watching us. And then, out of the corner of my eye, I see a shadow moving across the wall. A monstrous shape cast by an unseen form. Then the shadow moves down the corridor, and I hear a throaty purr as if it was right behind me. I only see it for a moment, a silhouette stark against a wall of high windows frosted with smoke. See, I was right. This demon is alive, watching us through the paintings. His dogs are his little servants. Claws, horns, and hooves like onyx. The white face of a goat, with red eyes fixed gleefully on me. I blink, and it's gone. Yeah, you better go away. Yeah, you want me to do, bitch? <laughs> I hear clambering off to the side, the creak of the door, and then silence. By the time I stumble down the stairs, disoriented, Porty is looking around corners for me. There you are. Where did the dogs go? Up the stairs? All I can muster is a dazed shrug. Porty takes me gently by the elbow. You know, I I'm just going to leave these cakes right here. Let's get you to bed. No, I want to go home. I follow at Portia's heels until we arrive at our destination. Thankfully, it isn't much further. She swings open the door with a sweeping gesture. These would be a gorgeous Orpheus. You can put your things wherever you like. Breakfast is at sunrise. I'll wake you. My fatigue must be showing. I let my bag fall to the floor. Eyeing the smooth linens, I shudder with exhaustion. You look ready to drop. Oh my god! I'll leave you be. Sleep well, Orpheus. Her soft voice trails off, and she gently slides the door shut. At once, I burrow into the luxurious sheets. It feels as though I'm weightless. Heart thumping to the rhythm of Portia's steady, ever-distant footfalls, I sink into unconsciousness. The chapter has finally ended. Now, before I go, I want to thank you guys so much for being so patient, so loving, so supportive with all of my videos. I'm incredibly grateful. I don't know what's going to happen in the next episode. I think we're going to track Julian down, but I'm not too sure. I don't want to. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next episode.